get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise A vast number of entrepreneurs Because it was some way of... of extending our families in because we'd lost families and so on um, so I, I'm surprised that you had so much difficulty yeah I don't know um, I don't know but um, hopefully I'll find more now that I see that maybe I was looking up survivor as opposed to the kinder transport well that's right it just go on to kinder transport yeah yeah there were ten of us. and um, Again, like your book, Let It Go, it's a must read. So I feel like it should have been named, they had a couple, I'm, I'm curious if you had other titles there, like Trailblazer, Pioneer, what were, what were the working titles there? I feel like if I were to name it, I would argue with Let It Go and name it Trailblazer or something like that. But I think it, 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 I, I'm, I'm much more sort of thinker than, than, than just a trailblazer. The let it go is a Buddhist principle of making sure that um, I don't carry with me the, the anger that I felt from, uh, from, from the Nazi Holocaust days yeah. and, and the, that you can actually move on. And it's a pun on information technology, of course, as well. Um, but um, I mean, I'm, I'm conscious that I've opened the door for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, I'm still an early adopter of technology. I'm sort of uh, early adopter. But... Yeah, I did a lot of research. Re you know, listen to your book. I'm looking at like uh, 25 pages of research. But I always like to know what is top of mind for you. What do you want to make sure that we discuss um, today? I think this paying back. Um, yes, I have been successful in business, but a long, long, it was 25 years before the company ever paid a dividend. You know, it was a long, wasn't this overnight success that yep. some entrepreneurs are aiming yep. for. Uh, and this giving back, I'm now a social entrepreneur. Yep. I've set up um, four different charities, three of which are now sustainable. And that is as much an achievement in a slightly different format as setting up my company from which my wealth stems. Totally. Okay. Yeah. I have a lot of those questions in here, so we'll yeah. definitely talk about that. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of Atari, Einstein Bagels, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, our sponsor today is rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country. Um, last year, this past year, we did events in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, and many more. We have not been to England yet. If you see the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate to get your business to the next level, go to rise25.com, contact us, and find out where our next event is going to be. It is my honor and pleasure today we have Dame Stephanie Shirley, known to business contacts as Steve because in a male-dominated business world, she would sign letters with her pen name. She'd get it in the door because she found that if she signed it with Stephanie, it would go in the trash possibly. So she started adopting Steve. She has an amazing book called Let It Go where it documents her life. It starts with her experience is an unaccompanied child refugee. Picture yourself at age five, what you were like at age five, and then now go on a train away from your parents to a foreign city, a foreign country. What would you feel like? And that's what happened to her. And her parents wanted to protect her from perishing in the Holocaust. Her early experience of the glass ceiling at work because of gender discrimination encouraged her to set up her own business, which she did in 1962 with only, I believe, six pounds at the time. And she created one of UK's first software startups. Uh, she forged the path for not only women, but the whole computing industry. And while planning to start a family, she hit on the idea of offering part-time employment to professional women with dependents. Essentially... She had pioneered freelance-driven business and wanted to be woman-owned. That's why, 
you know, Dame Stephanie, I am still arguing Let It Go should be called Pioneered or something like that. But we'll, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> Essentially, economy. this is my whole, like, argument for changing the title or, or the next book maybe be called Pioneer. Um, the, uh, the IT business prospered with a lot of hard work. In 1996, the company was floated on the London Stock Exchange, earning hundreds of millions of pounds, and it had employed 8,500 people. She made, I believe, 70 staff into millionaires. And this wealth has enabled her to devote her time and resources to giving something back to society. And she ranks among the world's leading philanthropists. And in 2013, she appeared on BBC Radio and actually discussed why she had given away more than $67 million of her, or pounds, sorry, $67 million pounds of her own personal wealth to different projects. And she supported strategic projects in the fields of autism. Her son Giles was autistic and IT, but her focus is purely on autism. And this is via the Shirley Foundation. They facilitate scientific research aimed to understand what autism is as opposed to what it looks like. Dame Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, I wanted to start off with, you know, what life was like before you go on the train. You're, you're you know, pre-five years old. Well, I was the younger daughter of a quite bourgeois family in Dortmund near Berlin. Uh, my father was a young judge in Germany. You could be a judge, qualify as a judge by examination. Uh, so he was a judge at the age of 33 or at the age of 30. And in 1933, when I was born, um, he was fired by edict of the so-called Third Reich. And really, the bad times began. But up to then, it had been, you know, I can remember walking in the many beautiful parks that they have in that city. Uh, I can remember trivial things um, of a child. Uh, what I can remember very clearly is the journey itself. Yeah. And I say very clearly, Jeremy, but you, you sort of think, have I really got this right? Have I imagined it? Have I seen too many films of the kinder transport? Um, is my memory really true? And of course, we, we never really know. Um, it was quite traumatic. It was... I mean, I have a four-year-old, Dame Stephanie, and, and have, I can't even yeah. imagine putting her on a train, saying goodbye to her, and be like, good luck, you know? Yeah. Well, some... Some families did, in fact, put their children on the train and then grab them off again. Um, I think it was an act of most deep love for yeah. my parents to send me away into the arms of strangers, really not knowing what was happening or what was going to happen, but knowing that if I stayed in Germany, the future for uh, Jewish families was just catastrophic. And um, in my current life, I come across... Um, parents of autistic children who are placing them in residential care for the first time. Mm. And it is the same, they're, they're all traumatized. They, they, it, and I, I'm able to explain to them that it is the most loving thing that they can do right. to let their child go into special education. And so I try to build on those bad times and, and tease out yeah. what helps me in the future. Yeah, it's almost a framing of framing them as you are not, you know, abandoning your child, but you are actually, it's the most loving thing you can do. Yeah. Um, talk about the two and a half day journey. I mean, you were on that, on the train for two and a half days. Just uh, so people get a sense of what that was like. Well, the scene in Vienna main station um, was bedlamic. I mean, nearly all the parents were crying. The children were crying and hysterical. Um, I wasn't. I'm a, quite a control person and was even then. Hmm. And the, the upset was um, softened by my mother, who had the insight to wrap little presents up for me 
so that in fact I was much more interested childlike in the train going because only when the train going was I allowed to open this little present mm. and um, I can remember that little very special present um, today I just shame I don't still have it um, and um, so we got on the train um, and my memory is of quite different train compartments to the ones that I've seen in, in, in films. Um, I do remember children sleeping in the, the overhead luggage racks um, and somebody queried this. And I thought, well, perhaps I've imagined that. And then I came across another kind of transport child and she said, yes, it did, that did happen. Mm. So it wasn't my memory uh, playing false. But we slept on the floor on strips of corrugated cardboard. Um, I don't know what we ate because maybe my mother gave us sandwiches. I just don't remember eating right. at all. Um, I remember a little boy who kept being physically sick all the time. And I think I can remember that when the train had many unscheduled stops, that he got off the train and was sick in the field. You know, a nice country field. It wasn't in a town. Um, and yet I've read that the trains were sealed because how else would you look after we had a thousand children on each train right. with just two um, what i would like to talk about is that in addition to those two adults um, there were some volunteers young girls in the main uh, 16 plus by in age um, and so not eligible to travel on the kinder transport but they served as volunteers to help with the younger children and um, they'd come to a deal that they could, were allowed to do that if they guaranteed that they would return to what they must have known was almost certain death. Mm. And I was to honour the sheer heroism of those young people. Um, and um, it's an amazing thing for a, a young girl to do, I think. Um, so there was some of the young people. Um, when I arrived at Liverpool Street Station in London, um, my recollection is that it was not only just a grey day, and then why should it be grey in July, but that it was very silent, that the, the platform was silent as all these hundreds of children streamed out onto the platform. Um, and I think I was just so frozen in my emotions that I misremember it in some ways. Uh, there's a lovely statue at Liverpool Street Station of a group of kinder transport children. Uh, and there's a child there that's about five years old. And you look back and you say, yeah, <laughs> when I see young children, it, 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 it's un, un, unbelievable. It's baffling. Yeah, it's unbelievable. You know. I mean, in today's day, okay, we have a cell phone. How do you even find the parent, the people that you're supposed to find among thousands of other kids well we, we had numbers around our neck so okay. that people knew which compartment we were in and, and who we were supposed to be going to that was well organized and i think that's the difference between the kinder transport it was it was set up by the german and uh, sorry set up by the christian and uh, jewish activists uh, it was supported by the quakers financially um, the masses of volunteers involved. So it was very well organized. And we did all get to the right um, parents in the end. Uh, but um, I remember waiting to be claimed. Right. Um, vast um, hall near Liverpool Street Station, um, where we sat on palliasses, which you're too young to know what a palliass is, but it's a sort of sack full of straw so mm. that one could rest on them. And, we, we, we waited to be claimed for quite some hours. So um, I, I look back and I try, Jeremy, not to um, be defined by that start. It's just a start of my life. It's been a very, very important motivator. It drives me today. The, the, the impact of that journey drives me today. Um, I don't like to waste the life that was saved and so i don't fritter it my days away and try to be um keep some gravitas as to what i'm doing um Puts it in has, perspective it yes i think so 
Your sister and you, did you have similar transition points? Your sister was older, right? She was older and we got landed with the responsibility of, of having her five-year-old sister clutching her. She was only nine years old. So it was, I was protected to a certain extent because I had her. Um, she reacted to, she reacted in a different way. Um, interestingly, she went into social work. Uh, as a children's officer in this country and then went out to Australia and in fact made a quite difference to Australian childcare practices. But she finished up actually placing the boat children from Vietnam mm. um, into adoptive and foster families um, in That was, I can't remember the year. 60s, was it? Must be later. Uh, okay. But anyway, she finished up place, placing lost children, on the, uh, unaccompanied children, into homes there. Um, and um, really, she also adopted a child and fostered two brothers, uh, which I think was just another generation fostering mm. two brothers, just as we had been fostered a generation back. And um, there is a sort of pattern to uh, making sure that your the, the, it, it also brings out this sort of nature nurture debate. Yeah. Um, who am I? Am I the child of my natural parents, or am I the child of my foster parents? And really, I'm the child of my foster parents. Hmm. You know, you alluded to it with the, you know, prove your life was worth saving, like throughout, that seemed to be a theme throughout um, the book. Um, talk, explain to people a little bit about, um, and use in the book, termed Holocaust guilt. When you've been through trauma such as we were, and we were very, I mean, let's get it in perspective, I feel very, very lucky, um, lucky to be saved, but also lucky in my foster parents, because it wasn't always successful. Yeah. Um, but somehow, as a child still, um, as a child already, I, I, I began to feel guilty that I had been saved, mm. um, in some weird, converse way, perverse way, sorry. Um, I've, I felt that I was almost responsible for the atrocities that had taken place. And that's a heavy sort of load for a six, seven, eight-year-old to, to For to anyone. Um, and that survivor guilt, which is apparently quite common, and it tends to lead to depression, and that I certainly had. I was severely depressed for a long, long time. I was suicidal a couple of occasions, um, and I finished up with a whole lot of six years of treatment at the rather renowned Tavistock Clinic. Um, and I, you know, today I'm not depressed at all. I can be sad about things, but I'm not depressed. Um, and if if the depression that follows guilt, survivor guilt has any um, answer, it, it is really compassion. And I think it has led very clearly to my focus on philanthropy, on giving back, on making sure that um, I just don't, I, I remember the good things about those difficult times. And there were many good things, good, good happenings, people putting their lives on the line um, for good reason. Yeah. And, and, you know, talk about like, so that moment you decide I need to start my own business. You felt you were hitting glass ceiling. What was going on at the time? There was, um, a, a, an incident in the lovely little computer company I was working with, um, where, um, I made some suggestion and was told very brusquely by the, uh, male members. So I was the only female, uh, at the meeting, that's nothing to do with you. And I got sort of quite edgy about that mm -hmm. and, and went 
and said, well, you know, um, this is a good company. I mean, I didn't have a lot of sexism there um, and decided that I was going to go my own way, build up the sort of company that I wanted to work for. Uh, and, I, and I thought other women would want to work with. And so it was quite a, an overnight decision. Uh, I went back the following morning, gave in my notice, worked my notice out, and then sat waiting for the telephone to ring in order to start off my business. Of course, there was no silence, <laughs> and I had to learn how to market, how to sell, and so on. And uh, it actually suited me um, really quite well. Uh, in business, you can do anything you like, as long as it is literally legal. Yeah. And so I did lots of new things. A lot of times, you know, people, when they start a business, it starts off as something different than it ends up. At the time, when you were starting it up, what was your vision? What were you going to, what service were you going to provide? Well, I was the first, or among the first, to provide a tailor-made software service. So this was not um, packages. This was designing and writing and delivering and training people to use software that hadn't been written before. Um, there were in those, those days no such things as programming manuals. We actually learnt um, on the machine itself uh, they were early days. Um, people laughed at the idea of having a whole lot of women write software. They also laughed because at that time, software was given away free with the hardware. And um, they just thought it was ridiculous. Nobody can sell software. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I didn't think I... I, th I think I saw the, the importance of software. Um, I was much more motivated, though, um, by this desire to work um, intellectually, professionally, effectively um, as a woman without having the restrictions of a male environment. And perhaps that's quite t topical in, the, in these days, but there is still a great difficulty for some women uh, today to have opportunities open to them. And certainly in my day, I'm talking about 19, early 1960s, um, it was very different. I mean, they just wet women doing this. I, I, I couldn't even open the company bank account without my husband's permission. You know, we were very much second class citizens. And we've gone through that. I've opened yeah. a lot of doors for other women as well. Yeah. So, Dame Stephanie, there, at that day, there was not a YouTube where you can look up and figure out how to code, right? But... I think you used to take night classes, right? And got, talk about that a little bit. Because not only were you working, now you're taking mathematics in the evening, right? I'd always wanted to be a mathematician and solve something called Fermat's Last Theorem. Um, and of course, I didn't have it in me to be um, so academically environment. But um, I needed to qualify um, with an honours degree in mathematics. And so I took that studying for six years at night school and doing a bit of uh, a year of statistics as well. And I made some good friends during that time. Um, I was living in London, so started off with no friends at all. So some of those friends lasted um, until the current time. How did you learn to code? I mean, that probably directly didn't teach you that, I'm assuming. There was a bit of trial and error, yeah. but also sit with it alongside. Oh, no, you don't want to do it like that. If you do it this way, it might work quicker. And, and so there was a lot of interchange. And as you found ways of doing things, um, you tended to talk about them. Uh, and it was physically talk about them with your colleagues. Right. Um, the other piece, you know, um, is I don't know, I want you to put things in perspective for people about what coding looked like then, right? Because now you type it directly in a computer, then it's a machine code sent by mail. So talk about the process of actually coding. We started off with paper and pencil 
Mm. Um, writing flow charts, basically defining the task to be done. If this, then that. If that, not that. Right. Um, and then we would transfer that into code pretty carefully, trying not to make errors. Um, code being in machine code, occasionally in binary. And this, some weeks are on, of course, uh, would then be sent by mail uh, to a data center where it would be punched onto paper cards or paper tape um, and then repunched in order to verify it. And eventually it would then be submitted to the computer. And the, 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 the fun and skill of programming uh, was in then getting all the errors out. We tried not to make errors, in, but we, we know that um, uh, th there's going to be a whole lot of correction. And life is like that. Nobody is perfect all the time. What we have to do is, is recover from difficulty, find different ways of doing things. And I found programming really suited my personality very well. Now we used to yeah. be quite quick and accurate. Yeah. You know, listening to Let It Go, it's... You know, you're getting on a train at five, going through a lot of tough times. And then people people see the business, it did really well in the end, but there was 25 years before you paid a dividend. And then on top of that, you're raising a family and your child, healthy child, then all of a sudden stops talking. And I'm like, when is this story gonna get rosy? Like this is, this is a, a story of, um, really difficult times, but I think people see the sometimes see the end result and think, okay, this was just a, a path to success and it was an overnight success. So talk about some of the hard times. It was 25 years before you paid a dividend. Yes. You would expect me to say that the hard times were financially the hard times during the 70s recession when we nearly went bust and we were sort of extraordinary. And I was got to the stage of selling personal capital items. Um, but um, in fact, the really hard times came with people. Mm. Uh, when very early on, I had a breakaway group, and now I know that most organizations have a breakaway group on average every seven years. But this was the first time I'd met it. And I was distraught and I was hurt and I was really um, shaken to the core that this sh should happen to me with uh, a colleague who my husband was, uh, what's the word I want? Uh, was, my husband was godfather to her child. I mm. mean, this was a close developing friendship and then she went off on her own and um, it took me a long time to recover from that really bad bad time you know you said that even in the research it basically talks about Derek being you know such a a core support for you um, yes he was so talk about what is some of the advice he was giving or the support he was giving throughout? Because like you said, you needed him to sign to start the business, right? And I'm, I'm sure actually maybe at the time some husbands would not be supportive of that, I imagine. Indeed not. Uh, we certainly had one colleague who I don't think her husband even knew that he, she worked because we all worked from home and it would all be tidied away nicely before her husband came home from his traditional um, work activity. Repeat the question. I mean, me. just some of the supportive things that uh, to paint the picture of, of Derek. Yes. Um, what would he do during tough times or? He, did, he suggested that I use the name Steve, the nickname Steve, instead of uh, writing letters with this double feminine of Stephanie Shirley. <laughs> um, and, and it's so much more macho to sort of say Steve Shirley. That was his suggestion. Um, when I'd be sort of mulling over, I've got this difficulty, what should I do? What should I do? He would come up with suggestions, well, didn't you meet somebody last year who had that skill? That sort of suggestion. He encouraged me um, that we had one uh, project for the Castrol Oil Company 
uh, which was uh, got into the most terrible difficulty, which I won't bore everybody with. But uh, I was stuck with this project that was late and it was important, blah, blah, blah. I was citing oil depots. Um, and um, I took holiday. Uh, my husband looked after our son Giles. And in that fortnight, I cleared it up. I was like a limp rag afterwards, but it, you know, I did do it. Now, without him, I couldn't have got through that. And when you're building a business, you really ha you're only as good as your last job. You cannot afford for yeah. the, the be late or, or, or poor quality. And um, I like the perfectionism of business and, and, and seeing this year is much better than last year and stuff like that. What made you think of, you know, you were also pioneered fixed prices at the time that was that was not normal? Well, that was for different reasons. Um, we had all these part timers and I was not disguising the fact that they were part timers working from home, but I was not stressing it. So to offer fixed prices, this was the team that was going to work on it. What wasn't said? is that this team was all part time and they were remote. And so it gave a much better facade of the services that we were actually providing. Um, and fixed prices were important externally for that reason. They also became important internally because we started to offer fixed prices internally to our freelancers. If you could do this bit of programming, we would pay so much. Hmm. And that sounds very practical. It gets the two um, costs uh, balanced, but it had a much more strategic impact in that um, it allowed um, less qualified people to get work because it was offered on a fixed price basis. If they took longer, if they had to take three weeks to, to train themselves before they could even start, um, that was their decision. And, and of course, that tended to empower people and led very much to um, a company with a uh, collegiate, some many people would say a feminine culture, uh, where um, it became almost natural for it to move from a company that paid well, behaved decently to its staff, um, paid bonuses, uh, but eventually moved into co-ownership. And I was inspired by the John Lewis partnership, and I did eventually get a quarter of the company into the hands of the staff at no cost to anyone but me. And that, you know, there was all part of that fixed price, surprisingly enough. The things that you do in business, they take time. They, they don't happen overnight. It was um, 1978 when I first thought of um, developing software in India. And that was to get access to um, a cheap workforce. Uh, it was 20 years later in the 90s. Um, that that actually happened, by, by which time the incentive had moved to sort of quality um, workforce in short supply. So, you know, the, the things that happen in business, are, I see as, as, as very long. Uh, the people that were important to me have been important over a long period of time. Um, very different from the quick, sharp way in which some business is run today. Or maybe, you know, will never be run in a long-term way. Why was co-ownership so important to you? With a service company, um, I didn't put any capital in. It was financed by my own labor, and eventually a, a second mortgage on the family home. Right. Uh, but... It, 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 it seemed to me that, especially in the 70s recession, my team of freelancers were, were holding the, the company together. It was, they were giving a facade of, 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 of successful business, even though we only had two contracts at the time and we were down to, you know, selling things. Um, and they were so important in, in seeing me through that I felt it was only right and proper and fair and this is what philanthropy is all about, making life fairer for people, um, that they should share in the wealth 
that they'd helped create. And so it is a bit of an ethos. Um, it is, I do, um, I was delighted to serve as the first non-executive director of the John Lewis Partnership, which is 100% staff owned. Um, but um, we got a quarter of it into staff ownership and, as I say, made a lot of millionaires of many people. Yeah, in the book, they talk about that, about the the millionaires that were created, but also the impact that those people had because of the, the money that they made, whether they started businesses or they were philanthropic also. You mentioned that I've given away some uh, 67 million in cash. But the largest gift I have ever given was getting 24% of the company into the hands of the staff. Because right. the company was eventually valued at nearly three billion dollars, wow. and so the largest gift ever. Which yeah, that's a big gift. <laughs> it's a big gift. <laughs> How did you get your first um, projects? What was the, what was the first significant project that you were able to to get? I think the very first one came from my ex-employer, which is fairly classic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to do something related to what I'd been doing right. in employment. Um, the next one was something called a company called Selection Trust in the city and asked me to do a program evaluation review technique um, for them. Um, and I can't remember any more detail of it, but I do know that it led to a whole lot of similar work. This was operational research work that had the um, commercial um, value of um, try again. It, it was commercially valuable, and at the same time, it was intrinsically difficult and interesting to people like me. And so, operations research work was a sort of compromise that that suited me. Um, stock of control was just coming into. Uh, at, a, at a scientific level was, was coming in in those days. So we did masses and masses of stock control um, for the Mars um, sweet company. And I can remember discussing whether it was professional to uh, uh, accept the goodie bags of Mars products that they, they, they gave The answer us. is always yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we took it very seriously. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was yes. <laughs> How did they find out about you? I mean, is it a referral or, because I imagine if you show up in person and it's a female owned business, there may be some discrimination there. Oh, um, I think the first contracts came from introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I learned really to market to, I started trying to market to American companies because they were more used to subcontracting the sort of work that we were doing. Um, and that led, Mars was one such. Um, then I was introduced, I think, to a company called Unilever, a big um, Anglo-Dutch company. And they then introduced us worldwide. So we worked for Unilever in Thailand, Unilever in South Africa. Mm. Uh, not fast contract, but it gave us this flavor of what we could do internationally. So we tried to exploit in a positive way the contacts that we had. Yeah. And I do assure you our work was quality stuff, otherwise we wouldn't have got it. I mean, as you bring on more and more clients, how do you grow the staff accordingly? That's also a tough part because, you know, now you're having to bring on more and more freelancers, right? One of the sad things is that you, you go into software because I love software and I enjoy writing it. And within a very short period of time, I'm paying other people to write the software and I'm doing the, the cash flow and the legal side and the mainly, mainly human resources. Yeah. You're doing so nothing it, when you started the business. Yeah. <laughs> very extraordinary, but it happens to everyone. And somehow if you don't make that, conversion into a business person of course you don't survive however clever you are yeah i mean how do you find all the staff um because as you get a unilever project which is all over the world and you don't have the freelancing staff or maybe you do kind of infrastructure already there how do you bring on more freelancers 
I never really had difficulty in recruiting mm. uh, because in the early days there was a sort of buzz among women and um, a, a tiny mention of the company in, in fact, the, the Guardian paper um, brought in a flood of women from all over England who wanted to work at a professional level, a vigorous professional career uh, at the same time as bringing up their family. And I could pick and choose among the women because nobody else was using them. They had been trained, they'd got into the computer industry, and we, we had um, requirements such as we really only looked at, we really only considered people who had, I think it was six years computer experience before we'd even look at them. So these were skilled wow. people, and it stayed like that. And I think we were good employers. Um, mm. and, so it was really an untapped resource yeah, I was just exploiting this untapped resource. Yeah. I saw a milestone also in the book um, about when you brought on a, a CEO. Uh, Talk about that decision. That, that seemed like a kind of a difficult decision at the time. I think bringing on managers is something that most entrepreneurs manage to do. But when it actually comes to a chief executive officer who's going to actually make the decisions that as founder and owner uh, you're used to making, that is very, very difficult. And it took me three goes to, have a, to, to do it um, over a period of about 11 years. So it's a whole phase in the company where I was trying to really move away from it. I was working internationally to get out of the chief executive's hair. Um, not successful twice, um, very successful on the third time. And this is how a lot of business is. It doesn't necessarily, unless you're absolutely brilliant, but you know, you, you have to persevere with things. It doesn't work. You still may have to try it again. And the third time, the appointed a woman, now sadly dead, Hilary Cropper, who, who was brilliant. And she took all the good things about the company, um, killed some sacred cows with, 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 without compunction, um, and made it really very, very profitable and growing in a very then professional, conventional corporate way. And that's how it floated. And that's how it was eventually acquired. Yeah. And it seemed like, you know, when the company was growing and you were able to actually take money out. Um, it wasn't to buy expensive cars or houses, it was really so that you can take care of Giles. Yes, um, vulnerable children can be extremely expensive, uh, but both, in, both emotionally and financially, it's estimated that a, a child like Giles costs about 10 million in his lifetime, Wow, 10 million. And that was the, one of the few financial incentives that I ever had. I realized that I, if I was going to sort him out, um, I needed to do something like that. Um, they were difficult times. A lot of people ask um, how I managed to build a business, which is a pretty full-time job, and at the same time rear a profoundly handicapped child um, and in fact, the two sort of balanced each other for, for many years. The only time I forgot my son Giles was when I was working. The only time I forget work, because I am a workaholic, was when I was with Giles. Mm. And that on for many, many years, very nicely balanced, um, but eventually got on top of me. And I had a good old fashioned nervous breakdown. And um, Giles finished up in hospital and never came home, um, except that yeah, that's another story. Giles finished up in hospital. How did you How get? Are you going to end What's that? <laughs> How are you going to end all this? <laughs> I mean, I love that. <laughs> this is this is fantastic. <laughs> um, you know the. I guess um, at the time, what did they have a good handle on what that like what autism was? What were they thinking no. was going on at the time? At that time. It was thought to be a result, a psychological result of poor parenting. Really? And it, wow. Oh, yeah. 
that didn't help either. You know, the thought that the professionals thought you, you just had made this happen by not being, you know, especially when you were working, maybe being a mathematician isn't the best training for to be a parent. And you think, is it me? And uh, um, Nowadays, we do know that it is a brain disorder. Sure. And uh, one of the charities that I set up is is doing nothing but research into autism, what it is. That I cannot believe that. So they actually said that to people at the time? Yeah. That it was, it's basically your fault? Yes. Wow. That's traumatizing in itself. Well, I mean, yes, it was pretty awful. The, the term used, which I'm loath to repeat because it perpetuates it, we were called refrigerator mums. Wow. That we were too cold, you know, you think that. Oh, wow. Yeah, not nice. That's horrible. And so, you know, with him, um, what was working as far as you said, you, you put him in to a separate facility and that was trying also. Well, he went to school. Um, I got him into a primary school at the age of five, I think. And he stayed there. He should have come out at 11, but I couldn't find anywhere else for him. So he stayed there till he was about 13. And then I couldn't find any schooling for him whatsoever. So he stayed at home with me. And that was the route, really, to disaster. Um, and as I say, he finished up in hospital and would have stayed there had not he begun to lose some of his human rights and um, triggered, really, my setting up the first charity. Because towards the end, it so seemed child, like... What's that? Giles was the first resident in the first home of my first charity. Right. It, that, seem, it seemed at the yeah, end. I it, no, I said it seemed at the end that there was, when you were set that up, it was, it was helping. It was, it was progress. Yes, it was. Was it progress? I think we felt, you know, there was nothing else we could do. We have to try this now. Um, it wasn't set up as a charity to begin with, because until you have three residents, you can't just make a charity of looking after your own son. Um, bad times. Yeah. Um, and so with the talk about the Shirley Foundation and what you're doing with the Shirley Foundation. My mission, and I'm quite clear about this, is to be pioneering, uh, never more of the same, no matter how worthy, and to be strategic. So it's not just helping this person or that group, but something that will actually um, have an impact long term on a whole sector. And so the big contracts, they are, it's, it's, it's the word I want, social philanthropy, really, venture philanthropy. Um, so the first organization, which started just with Giles, now looks after 143 people um, and keeps an overview of another 100. And that's today and it's growing. Um, it, the second one is the biggest one I've ever done, um, which is a school um, which now employs 600 people looking after 100 pupils, has a young adult centre um, taking pupils from 19, students from 19 to 25. Um, and that is of world renown now. Um, it, uh, I used to think the company would be my legacy. Um, but that's not going to happen. It's changed its name. It's owned by somebody else. I, I no longer think of it as that's my legacy. But I do think of the school as going to be my legacy. It's a charity. I do expect it to be there in 100 years' time. And the third charity is Autistica, which um, funds medical research. And that is now 10 years old or something like that. And I'm enormously proud of it because that really is 
addressing some of the issues, getting people interested in research, getting people to contribute to research, because that has to be the long term good future. What's been some innovations with Artistica or just the research in general? What have you found is what's progressed? Uh, typical of the study is, is um, work looking at uh, mental health in autism and why a large number of uh, people with autism commit suicide, um, why um, people with autism die 14 years earlier on average than people without autism. Now, these are big questions that are real in the real world that make a difference to families. So it, it, we set up a, an autism brain bank, um, which is now mm. the largest brain bank in the world because the American one, something went wrong with it and it, it absolutely failed and it's useless now. Um, and um, people's brains are um, very, very valuable material to researchers. There's still things that you can only do post-mortem, uh, and they do tell you a lot about autism. Um, I started the looking at the economics of autism. That was in 1997, uh, and employed a university department to actually work out what is the cost of autism and I think I've mentioned it the cost to to a family is 10 million wow. um, the cost to, from the nation's point of view is now 32 billion a year and that's mainly in lost employment because if we could and we're working on this get people into employment even though they are autistic um, that would make a tremendous difference to the, that financial, $32 billion a year. Dean Stephanie, has anything interesting stick out to you that's come out of the Autism Brain Bank? I think it's all too technical for me. Yeah. I think that's, I, I don't know what they do with it. Yeah. It's been used for something like, what they say, a thousand experiments so far, um, which is, you know, the sort of measures that a philanthropist yeah does you know it is in use i also set up the autism sorry the oxford try again i also set up the oxford internet institute and that was a way of trying to give back to the sector from which my wealth stems um, some of the money and that now is of world renown um, i was on their advisory board for 10 years um, and it, it it's just great and i just bask in the reflected glory of some of the, the work that they that they do there. Um, it's very good. I want to talk about just um, the future for a second. Um, you have a lot of wisdom in the business field and in innovating the research um, and the, the caring of autism. What, um, business-wise, um, as far as the, the future of technology, um, you know, you're talking to a you know founder of a a company. What things should they be thinking about uh, for the future? It has to be artificial intelligence. Uh, the sort of robots that I was using in, in a factory production environment 50 years ago now means that we we have. Uh, robots that can be colleagues, robots that can be um, the expert systems, they can deal with the um, annual reports, they, the, the whole administration of business is, is, is very largely going to be not just will be, be done by robots. Um, I'm using a robot to teach um, autistic children and I don't design the thing or anything like that, but it's marvelous to see what a robot can do. Um, not just cheaper, um, not just better, but do things that people can't do. And that's the exciting way that it's moved on. Hmm. And then what should people be doing to help the future of autism? 
I should have known that you're going to ask this question. I mean, it shouldn't just be on your shoulders, right? I mean, you've done a lot. Oh. You've set up a lot of charities and foundations and, and research and care facilities. But, you know, if someone's listening, let's say their, their family member or child has autism, what should they be doing? The big the big thing that I think people should be doing is learning to appreciate that autism is a different way of looking at the world. It's not just a disorder, a disease, all those names that we used to use, all those terms that we used to use 50 years ago. Um, but we now realize that people with autism see the world differently. They have different sensory systems. Their brains work differently. We can see that with some of the brain work that studies that's going on. And it then becomes a matter of diversity that people with autism should have the same or similar opportunities as you or I do, opportunities for education. My Giles was considered to be ineducable. Nobody tried to educate him. Um, that view of autism as just different, not a discrepancy, just different. Yeah. And that's what's going to make a lot of difference. Yeah. So I have one last question. This has been absolutely fantastic. I just want to thank you so much. Um, I have one last question. But before I ask it, I want to point people towards where they should find some of these resources online. I know they can go and let it go, get it on Amazon or Audible or wherever you can get the book, yeah. let it go. Where else should we point people towards online? The, we have a Steve Shirley website. Okay. Steve.com. Steve Shirley. Steve Shirley.com. Steve okay. One word, Steve Shirley.com. The National Autistic Society. Autistica. Autistica. Autistica.com Autistica also? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So we go okay. Steve Shirley.com, Autistica.com. No, Autistica is dot uh, org. Is that dot org? Dot org. Dot org. Okay. okay. Well, look up Autistica and check it out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, check it out. I, I highly recommend everyone get and read or listen to the book, Let It Go. It's it's fantastic. Um, it will There's change. Also, look at my TED Talk. What's that? <laughs> Have you seen my TED Talk? Have you seen my TED Talk? Oh, yeah, talk? of course. Well, then we should tell people. To yeah, look at that. you can go to the TED Talk on YouTube or uh, it's probably on your site too. Um, it's it's Wait not it doesn't do the same book. justice though as the book, right? I mean that's like thirteen no, minutes. But yeah. if if you're lazy and you don't want to, you should read the whole <laughs> listen to the whole book. Um, then you can watch the TED Talk, which is about thirteen minutes. Let um, me ask you: did, did you listen to it or did you read it? I listened to it. Interesting. Oh, yes. Good. Yes. Yeah. I if love it. Will be a film, Joe. There'll be a film. There will film coming out yes they're when, starting next year uh they're starting next year i don't know what it's going to be called yet but um looking forward to that okay awesome then everyone if you're listening look out for the film as well do we know the name yet or is it remains to be nope. no revealed. to be revealed to be yeah. revealed okay <laughs> name to be revealed so i always like to end with inspired insider with um two questions which is one what's been a low point and how you push through, and we've talked about a, a, a couple, and then what's been a proud moment for you? I think the low point I've already mentioned when I had a breakaway group, it really took me down um, into the depths. And the high point is again to do with people. Um, when I took the company into co-ownership, I was enormously thrilled about that. I don't think people realized how important it was, but I was thrilled. It had took, taken me a long time. Um, I still get on platforms and talk about my co-ownership, what we did. Um, and that certainly was a high point for me. Yeah. I want to be the first one to thank you, Dame Stephanie Shirley. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure and honor. So thank you very much. Lovely to meet you. What I got, you can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side See, life's like a peach if you find the sand And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand